I have to say continue. We are live. This is Feed Your Soul Mixtape. And today we're talking about love and relationships for Galentine's Day. For those of you who don't know what Galentine's Day is, it is actually the day before um, Valentine's Day. This is very new to me as well. So I just found out about this. I, I was hearing a lot about Galentine's Day. I didn't know what that meant. So I have Lori here with me. So we're going to be girls talking about love and relationships and celebrating Galentine's Day. So apparently yeah. it's the girls version of celebrating um, your girlfriends, talking about love, relationships, and, you know, if we weren't in a pandemic state of mind we could actually have a brunch party or get together for tea or have like a Valentine's Day party but this year it's all virtual so here we are hi Laurie how are you hi happy Valentine's Day happy Valentine's Day <laughs> it's funny I mean Valentine's Day could be about encouraging each other in our careers and things like that but generally speaking, women care so much about relationships, our relationships with everyone in our lives, children, parents, friends, lovers. So I think it's appropriate for gals to celebrate Galentine's Day the way we we're going to. Yeah, I think it, it could also be, we could um, reclaim it as a, a way to empower each other because I feel like Valentine's Day has such like pressure around it I feel this year I'm actually embracing it a lot more uh funny enough that I'm just like you know I want to talk about it this is fun let's talk about it but I feel like around Valentine's Day there's such a pressure especially around women that is like what are you doing for Valentine's Day you know what are your friends doing and and then having I've gone to like uh, Valentine's Day parties before the pandemic. Let's just put that in parentheses. Uh, but I've gone to anti Valentine's Day parties. You know, they have single Valentine's Day parties. And then even when you are in a relationship, you have that uh, looming over the relationship that you're like, what are you getting me for Valentine's Day? What are you doing for Valentine's Day? You know, th there's so much pressure around it. Can we can we talk a little bit about that? too? Yeah. Yes, I like that topic. That's why, you know, last time, last week, I said every day can be Valentine's Day. And yeah. that's my belief. The, the pressure is, it has to do with um, somewhat competition with other women, I guess. And, um, oh, there goes my cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Is that and, a female um, cat? Is she yeah. a gal? She's a gal. She's helping <laughs> celebrate Valentine's Day. You're included. So, what's her name? <laughs> what's, what's your kid's name? Pebbles. And Pebbles? by the way, there used to be a Bam Bam, but he was a little abusive, so we had to go. Aww. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that happens, you know, abusive partners. <laughs> yeah, go. sometimes you got to move on. So, um, you know what, to me, it has a lot to do, not just Valentine's Day, but a, a pitfall, let's say, of relationships is writing scripts writing a script, like I'm expecting this. And if the person doesn't do that, it means this. So I wrote a script, they don't know what it is, but if they don't follow the script, they're gonna be punished or it means something that it doesn't necessarily mean because it's a separate person with a separate thought process and way of expressing themselves and love language. Now I've had you taken our advice last week and had been communicating what your love language is with your love, you have a good chance of having a nice Valentine's Day and having a Valentine's Day all year. Yeah, so definitely have to communicate. Uh, I feel like communicating your needs is a big thing um, because a lot of the times as women, we have this idea of what we should want or should, you know, like. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine even um, that, I feel like so much of our lives, you, you're always um, kind of reflecting back what is the expectation of the, the male, you know, for those who are in a male female relationship, but, um, okay. you know, you're thinking about what is the man going to think, you know, I'm speaking from my own experience or, or like my friends that, 
you know, talking about this, uh, like, what is the man going to want or what does he want in their relationship? Does he want a relationship, a serious relationship? Does he want monogamy? Is he looking for marriage? Is he looking for long term? Does he want just something casual? And we're just having this conversation that I flipped the, the mirror and I asked her, you know, well, what do you want? You know, why are you always going off of what he wants, what they want? Have you checked within yourself, like just center yourself and like really realize what do you want? What are your needs in a relationship? What would make you happy? Because a lot of the times I feel that women forget to ask for their needs and have their needs met. And they're just like, you know, um, floating around in this like limbo area, just waiting around to see what the guy is going to decide. But a relationship is, has to be about two people two mature, you know, adult partners who are communicating about their desires, their wishes, their needs that can meet each other's needs or, you know, meet in the middle or talk about it and know what is important for each other. Right. I mean, to make it a healthy, balanced relationship. Yes. That sounds very wise. Um, I would say talking about the guy or whoever, the potential partner, they may not know what they want and they may not have decided. <laughs> a lot of times, generally speaking, women want a decision. You know, you're, are you going to be my boyfriend or not? They may not know yet. And you're rushing it if you want to, if you may not want to rush in so quickly either. It takes time to get to know somebody. So, I would say, take your time. You know, you, you can ease into commitments over time based on how it goes. Do you feel emotionally safe? Do you feel like you can say what you want? Can you talk about your love languages? Are you listening to what they're telling you? Now it's all, you know, we're talking in a theoretical, hypothetical way and but we've also had personal experiences. So, I mean, easier said than done, some of these yeah. things, but we can practice, we can practice, just like going to the gym, working out. At first you get sore muscles that were unused and it might hurt a little bit, but if you understand that there's, a, you know, potential benefit now we're getting into the concept of healthy boundaries. It's healthy self-discipline. When you understand the potential benefits and rewards, it's worth going through some trouble for a bigger picture. And it gets easier. If you have to use the practice of exercising, it's going to get easier and you're going to be more fit and healthier. And mm -hmm. it's from practicing. It's not like you do it once and done. There's not once and done. We're living in a space-time continuum on earth. I mean, we could argue that um, a part of us is not, it's on the soul level and it's every time is now, there's no past, present, future, but we're experiencing it as past, present, and future. So that's the practical of being on earth. It, it's over time. It's not one and done. I, I have self-awareness about something, so that's solved. No, it's a first step. I have self-awareness of my past patterns, for example. So. Now I, it's on me to be more conscious and pay more attention to my own feelings and responses and how others are feeling and responding to me so I can steer and adapt. Yeah. No, I definitely, by moment. It's minute by minute. Yeah, I definitely agree with you also. What you said is easier said than done because obviously, it, but I mean, we, we don't always know these things. Obviously it's easier to know it doesn't mean that you know everything that is going to be automatically applied to your life. We can apply, yeah, step by step. But also, if you don't have any awareness of this, it would be very difficult to apply if you're not even self-aware when those things are happening or aware of your partner. So I do feel like awareness is the first step. But definitely you have to have, you know, give yourself grace and have that self-compassion to yes. apply it step by step. Yes. And it can start with, I would say, curiosity. As I wrote in my little book, I showed you last time, one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves is to be curious about what's going on inside of us instead of at odds with it, fighting it, ignoring it, 
drowning it with alcohol or drugs, food, whatever. It's um, get curious, be interested in what's going on inside you. Hmm, that's interesting. Why this happened hmm, made me feel this way. Why am I feeling this way? And now we get to, that's bringing us to the topic of the inner child, which when we talk about healthy boundaries, there's tools, there's things we can, concepts we can discuss and it's really worthwhile to pay attention to that. At the heart of it is what we do have control over is our relationship with ourselves. We do not have control over other people's responses. We can position ourselves with awareness and compassion and love to elicit a po more positive response than if we go at people on the attack or whatever. We can set things up for a better response than maybe we had in the past. Yeah. But what we really only have control over is ourself, our response to ourself, our self care. So becoming aware of the inner child wounded likely inner child and healing that, working with that, growing it up in a way is to me the pathway to the healthy boundaries and the practice and the discipline, like working out to or toward having it be more natural and easy to exercise your healthy boundaries appropriately in any situation. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of boundaries too, uh, finding out what you want in a relationship, I feel that even, you know, for women, you know, women and men, but it's not as easy as it sounds too, because I see a lot of uh, men that if you say, you know, that you would like to have a relationship or you go into that topic when you first start dating, he would immediately assume, like I've been in this position that even if it's like a first or second date, or if you just met somebody, you know, you're having a conversation about it, they will assume that you want a relationship with them. But <laughs> and like to me, that's like so it's just like it's so conceited to just like well, assume there's that you're that. the one, you know. I'm just like there's uh, that. There is it's that. like I'm looking for the person that I would want to have a relationship with. It doesn't mean that every guy I ever meet in my life is someone I yeah. want to have a relationship with, you know. I mean, the, I think a correct, appropriate answer for that could be we'll see. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> Um, exactly uh, I mean, and yeah, I was, there's so many stereotypes there's so much expectations there's so much we talked about this a little last time about falling into unconscious patterns beliefs expectations prejudices and that's not the same thing as being present and aware and taking it moment by moment day by day because that's being present you want to be present to yourself and other people. And if you can be present, healing, forgiving the past, facing the future, you have a better chance of being self-aware. What do I really think? What do I really feel? What do I really want? Did it change from a year ago? Do I want different things than I wanted a year ago or 10 years ago? Maybe. Yeah. Being present is being available as well, emotionally to other people. So that's part of what we want to be able to do to be in a relationship is to actually be there, present, listening, hearing. Yeah, I think you touched on a very important point, which is about being present with where you are and who you are at that moment in time, because there comes a way that you start reacting to the stereotypes. And that's a very important point about the stereotypes around women, stereotypes around relationships, stereotypes around even your own expectations. You know, that is something that I've felt as well at some point in my life that I had expectations to myself, towards myself, that weren't even things that I wanted for myself. They were just things that, you know, someone... Yeah. Yes, or the ones you know, my it's family like wanted for me or my friends wanted for me yeah. or people thought it was the right thing for me to do, but it wasn't what I actually wanted. Right. That's You could call that programming. Programs, we call it when it's coming from outside and not coming from inside. And it's part of what we were talking about a minute ago with writing scripts. There's where prejudices and things like that come in with other people is 
like I said, writing a script, I have this expectation and it's really so unfair. It's like a lot of times it's like consciously trying to test someone. I've decided in my head that if he or she doesn't call me back within so many hours or doesn't text me within so much time or doesn't do what I want at the time that I decided, it means something horrible. It's so unfair to the other person and also to yourself because you're causing yourself so much drama and stress, expecting the worst in a way or setting it up where they can't win because they didn't even know that, that you made up your mind about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. I mean, I told, I totally, I've been there too. Uh, <laughs> that is that you create your own expectations or your own rules, but you right. forget to tell the other person. Right. <laughs> right. And the same thing with, with yourself, like let's say programs are, you know, your expectations that aren't really what you want or that un unreasonable or unrealistic. It's an aspect of boundaries. Mm -hmm. There's many aspects to boundaries in my understanding and study and practice. And one of them is, do you have realistic or unrealistic expectations of yourself or others? Or do others have them with you? And how are you trying to live up to unrealistic, unachievable expectations? Or are you not having any expectations? Like the expectations are so low. I'm such a piece of crap that I'm not going to even try anything in life. So I have my bar so low for myself that it's, I can live up to that, but it's not testing yourself to grow as a person. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it comes around to self-esteem and, and self-worth and feeling like you don't deserve what you really wish or what, what is your true desire. And not only in relationships, I think we deal with that, you know, is the famous imposter syndrome that you're looking for something or you know you want something, but you kind of talk yourself out of it instead of talking yourself into it, you right. know, keep going. Yeah. We talked about that a little bit, a little bit last time too, where you, if you set an intention, I want something. Every, and, and like as a commitment, I want this. Every part of you that disagrees with that is going to start coming up and it's coming up because it's there for you to heal it and deal with it. Your higher self is saying, I, okay, I get that you want this. Your inner child is working together. I, I get that you want this, but what about this, 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 this? Can you realize that those are limiting beliefs and wounds to be healed rather than the truth? When negative stuff comes up inside us, we have a tendency to believe it as gospel truth. And we see evidence outside of ourselves. If we look at it for what it is oh this is maybe an old tape a program I, this happened to me and that's why I feel that or I realize um, this is making me feel bad about myself and to start questioning is it true it lies it's there to make you feel safe like you won't take any steps out of your little safety cocoon if you um, if you listen to that because maybe with the new thing you're affirming, I want this healthy, interdependent love relationship. And I'm not sure how to get there. I'm not worthy. It's too hard. It's too scary. Remember what happened last time? That's what comes up because it's unresolved stuff. That's all. It sounds like it's the truth and the voice of God and listen to this and I'll keep you safe. But that's not really what it is that's why i say get curious about that and you could dig into why that's there why is less important though than what's the positive lesson how do i grow from this mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about the inner child uh, in relationship to the healthy boundaries setting up i would like to talk about inner child um i went to share i took a class with my teacher who her name's Judy Nelson, who taught me um, clairvoyant studies and was my first teacher in energy healing. She's a wonderful neutral person. And I went back to her for a class about, about the inner child. And it was a lot about healthy boundaries. And she says, this is, I think, a great place to start. I'm just going to read from her thing. We're all wounded on some level. 
because our inner child came into the world innocent and tender and found that not everyone is loving and supportive. Perhaps it was family members, other children or teachers that treated you cruelly. There's a reason why they're there. Now I'm paraphrasing. You are loving because on some level, your feelings were crushed and you chose the loving path to find your way back up out of the dark and painful place. She's referring to possibly past lives. Others are cruel because on some level, their feelings also were crushed, but they didn't have the inner strength to find that loving path. So they continue to repeat the cycle of cruelty to others and probably to themselves because they didn't know what else to do. It doesn't make it okay, but it, we need to understand, at least we understand that why they did what they did. They were suffering too. We're talking about the child and, and my family members, children, teachers, treated cruelly because their inner child was hurt. Um, okay. So the problem with all this is you learned not to love you. You learned you're stupid, ugly, worthless, untalented, not good enough, not lovable. None of that is true. But the effect over the years, it makes your inner child feel small, incapable, insignificant, bad about yourself. So um, here's a quote from Desiderata. It's a wonderful poem that you might want to share. Yeah, sure. Audience. You are, and this is just one piece of it. You're a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. That's beautiful. I have it's exercise for this, but I want to say my own exercise. I don't think I made this up. I think I learned it from someone. I can't remember who. One of the greatest ways to begin to connect with and heal your inner child is to get a picture of yourself, a baby or, you know, between one and four or something like that. A child picture of yourself and have it where you can look at it a lot on your mirror, on your dresser and connect with it and see that beautiful, what are the words I found to say the right thing? You're a child of the universe. The innocent, tender child of the universe that has a right to be here. The innocent, tender, sweet, fun being. We all come here that way, fresh and clean. So see that in your own picture and give love to that picture into you. Just do it to the picture if that helps you because that picture is a picture of you. Yeah. I think that's a very simple, positive practice that can help you soften back into who you really are. Oh, I love that. That's one exercise. <laughs> and yeah, I really love that. And I feel that sometimes, um, even when I've been doing meditation lately, this image of the inner child and even going back to that childlike quality, it has been so alive for me uh, when I'm doing meditation that it's just that feeling of like being carefree as a child, you know, and I just, re I remember just like running through the fields, running through the grass, just like being out in nature. Um, and I think even like being close to nature is sometimes the closest thing to getting that feeling back of your inner child. Um, I went hiking today and, and just like being out in the sun, going hiking, you know, having that feeling of just being a child, just playing and playing out in the world. Right. Um, if we can carry that feeling to everything that we're doing, I think that would be such a, a game changer. It lifts up your energy. <laughs> And what you're talking about too is being present. Children are present. They're intensely into pretending to be Little Red Riding Hood or in, in awe of something in nature or coloring or whatever it is. Children are present. They're not sitting, judge, first of all, sitting saying, is mine better than hers? There's no judgment at all of good and bad. It's like, this is fun. That's it. That's the criteria. Is it fun or not? Yeah, to mine, and um, I have another exercise we can do, but that is beautiful. That's exactly what I'm saying, and that's practicing. You're getting back, practicing the feeling of what that inner freedom and joy and alive, and I'm connected with nature 
exactly. I'm connected with life. I'm part of all life. I am part of the one is the feeling, right? And it feels good. Yeah. No, it feels amazing. It feels great. Yeah. Imagine being able to bring that into a relationship and someone else coming into the relationship with you also capable of that. You're not always going to be at the highest because we have, like I said, school, it's advanced studies, being in a relationship. There's life pressures. Things are going to happen where you're not going to always maintain it. But if you practice going there to that good feeling, just looking at the picture of yourself as a child can help you get there, especially if you practice. Yeah. That love relationship with your inner child. Would you like to try a little exercise? I, I think this is so Sure. Good. Yeah, let's do it. It's a little meditation. It's she calls it the thoughtful brain mantra. It's to connect you with your genius front of the brain. And okay. it's for the inner child. So hold palms together in front of your chest position. Close your eyes. Tune into your inner child in the center of your chest, your heart chakra. Take a breath. Your inner child wants to be free and creative. Now separate your palms, but keep your fingertips touching. Separate the palms and then separate the fingers a little bit, keep your eyes closed. And chant slowly and in your native language. Chant slowly as you touch your thumbs together and the index fingers going through the fingers. Yes, I am in charge. Yes, I am in charge. Yes, I am in charge. Native language. My native language is Portuguese. That's so good in Portuguese. <laughs> listening to this, it's your language. <laughs> you don't have to say it out loud. Eu tenho tudo sob controle. Eu tenho tudo yes, sob controle. Eu tenho tudo sob controle. Make the words flow for the slow duration fingertip touching. Yes, I'm in charge. Yes, I'm in charge. Yes. Eu tenho tudo sob controle. Eu tenho tudo sob controle. Eu tenho tudo sob controle. Charge. Yes, I'm in charge. In front of the heart. It's suggested to do this for two minutes. We don't have to do full time right now. And it's suggested to your eyes closed the whole time. When you're done, you stand for a moment with your palms touching in front of your chest in a prayer position. And then open your eyes. Mm. Wow, How does that thank feel? You. That feels good. It brings you back good. to the present moment feel present Mm -hmm. i need to try more doing it in portuguese because i do a lot of mantras and affirmations in english but it does feel different i always pray this is something interesting because i always pray in portuguese um because i learned you know from my grandma since i was little so i remember just being a little kid like praying you know for my garden angels praying to god and all in portuguese so when i go into prayer um I always go into prayer in Portuguese. So maybe I should try um, incorporating sense, affirmations. Isn't that the language of your inner child? Yeah. I never if thought you were, about when it. When you were a child, that's the language you spoke. So it makes sense. If you want to communicate to inner child, speak Portuguese. Wow. I really never thought about that before like that. I think that's- inspired by Judy Nelson. I can't take credit for all the wonderful things that I've learned in life. <laughs> it is, it, it does That's give it a teacher. different quality because it brings you back to that moment in time. Yeah. You can get your, find a picture or two of yourself as a child and speak to it in Portuguese. Or you don't have to speak out loud, you know, with your mind. Mm-hmm. I love you so much. You're so sweet. I had a re- really big breakthrough with inner child. When I was in this class, we had an exercise, which I'm going to do a version of that with, you know, we could do it in a little while. A version of it of holding a baby in your arms. And would you ever say to a baby kind of things you say to yourself in your own mind? 
that's what the teacher asked us and I burst out crying I was like no never I'm gonna cry right now I guess <laughs> I'm okay um okay, okay. never <laughs> never, okay never could I talk if to a baby cry, that's okay I know it's okay <laughs> never to a baby would I talk to a baby in the way I have sometimes talked to myself and never a baby doesn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. And we all have a baby inside of us that is hearing our negative self-talk in addition to the self-talk, to the negative talk that comes in. Yeah. So we really have a responsibility as adults to our inner child, the baby part of us, the sweet, tender, innocent baby to treat it the way you would a, a human baby. You have a child, ideally you give it a lot of love and a lot of nurturing. And if it poops in, not with the diaper on, you know, if it makes a mess, if it throws things, it, understand it's doing its best at its age. That's part of where unhealthy boundaries stuff and wounds come in is when adults and parents think children should behave in a way that inappropriate for their age. They don't, their development isn't there yet. They just can't do it. Mm -hmm. Realistic expectation. So some of us learn very, very young, unrealistic expectations. Parents have expectations of us that are not physically capable of or emotionally capable of. So as adults, a big part of healthy boundary to my mind, the healthy self-nurturing and healthy self-discipline. Healthy self-nurturing, paying attention to your own needs and caring for yourself, being a good mother to yourself. In the traditional role of mother, it's just convenient to use that. Healthy self-discipline, understanding of and weighing rewards and consequences, being a good father to yourself. Again, traditionally what a father does, not always, sometimes it's the other way around, but generally speaking, mothers are, you know, have the nurturing role and fathers have the discipline role. Of course, in modern life, a lot of times the mother is the disciplinarian also, or instead it can be flipped. So let's not get hung up on semantics. It's just two aspects of healthy boundaries. There are others healthy, realistic expectation, healthy self-nurturing, healthy self-nurturing is caring enough to be curious. How am I feeling? How am I feeling? What do you want? What do you need? And can I realistically give it to you? This is going deeper than I want ice cream. Okay. Sometimes, but unhealthy nurturing would be just piling down ice cream anytime you feel upset healthy nurturing is i'm not gonna say i've never done that before but (laughs) (laughs) who hasn't ice cream sometimes ice cream can be soothing yeah it's just it's within reason anything within reason if it's going to make your inner child feel loved and nurtured in a moment that it needs it okay it's unhealthy would be that that's a go-to and I'm skip right past feeling and not pay attention why I feel this way right to the soothing part. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's other ways of self-soothing that might be healthier than ice cream. And ice cream is not the worst thing in the world. It has protein. It's one of the healthier desserts supposedly, but um, what are other ways that you can soothe yourself before you have the ice cream? Maybe you could take a little walk and do your connection with nature. And by the time you get back, you don't really want it anymore. Mm-hmm. Or you make a collage, get in the present with a project. You may not even feel that anymore. That's what's interesting about starting to listen. What do you really want? Well, I really wanted to speak up to such and so, and I didn't when I had the chance. And I'm mad at myself and da, 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 da. Just hearing it out. The inner child wants to be heard wants to be heard. So just hearing it out, you might immediately start to feel better. Yeah. Healthy self-discipline is an understanding of rewards and consequences. If you sit in front of the TV all day, probably you're not gonna write a novel. 
That's the consequence. There's a reward. It's comfortable. I'm not testing myself. I'm not challenging myself. I'm not exploring my creativity. I'm zoning out in front of some entertaining movies and TV. So um, that's the consequence. Not going to be really do what you want to do. You know, sometimes the potential reward is so great, but we're so scared of a little consequence that we don't take a step toward a great reward. And conversely, sometimes for a potential tiny reward, we take a great risk. Like imagine hold, you need some money and you hold up a 7-Eleven or a grocery store with a gun to get some money. Let's say you're holding up a 7-Eleven. You might walk out with $150, $200. Potential consequence, go to prison for a few years. Is it worth it? If you really think it out, probably not. Um, that's part of what I'm about, rewards and consequences. It's thinking it out. The potential reward, well, I'm nervous to go out. I'm afraid of being rejected. But potential reward, new friend, new love, new a whole new experience of life. It's worth that. There's a difference between this part of being curious how you feel. There's anxiety with a dread. Like when someone is asking you to live up to an unrealistic expectation, do what I want, and you don't want to, or you don't think you can, or you're going to get a consequence, you're walking on eggshells. Um, there's the dread anxiety versus excited, nervous, but excited. It's exciting, it's appealing, but I'm nervous, I'm afraid of consequences, but it's pulling me a little. Mm -hmm. That's part of uh, listening to yourself. Is this worth taking a baby step? Excuse me, baby. Yeah. And I take a few steps. Either way, you can take steps and just see, honestly, how do I feel? How do I feel now? How do I feel now? And I just, the dread is getting worse. The anxiety hopefully is lifting. I want to uh, ask you actually right where you are, uh, what you just brought it up. In, in that moment of, you know, you're dealing with anxiety or you're dealing with the dread and walking on eggshells because that happens even in the early stages of dating or in the relationship as well. Um, and I've had the experience of, you know, in both cases of being in a relationship and not feeling like I'm able to speak to my partner because something, you know, if I'm a hundred percent honest and I'm not talking about huge, you know, um, deal breakers, I'm just saying like in the daily little things of, you know, daily life, that I'll feel, you know, oh, if I say this, like, he'll be really angry, you know, if I want to go here, if I want to do this, and sometimes in detriment of, you know, what I really want to do, or pursuing a goal, or a dream, or, and not having that support, and, and when do you realize those red flags, and how do you get out of it without, or bring it up to, to the partner, if you think it's worth continuing the relationship, or how do you get out of, of a situation like that, uh, without feeling guilty, because I feel that a lot of the times when you're honest and you do stand up for yourself, what comes right after, at least from my experience, is the guilt of the reaction of the partner, because um, I don't know if it's only a, a male thing, but it's just like that male dominant personality uh, sometimes no, not overpower, necessarily. not necessarily only male, but it's like- I've experienced like, it with women, so- yeah, but it's, yeah, right, exactly. Right. It could be man, men or men or women, but that male energy of like overpowering, uh, you know, hijacking kind of your own, um, your own feelings that you end up feeling like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't, I shouldn't want this. And you second guess your own feelings because mm -hmm. someone is making you feel so guilty over, you know, your comfort zone or your boundaries, your healthy boundaries or some that you end up doing something you're not comfortable with. How do you get out of that? What is the best deal, um, best way to deal with that? Well, you're bringing up a lot of issues that have to do with boundaries and yeah. communication with healthy boundaries and the, the healthy discipline aspect of it. Um, you're seeing it as there's such potential consequence. Just telling the truth to someone is so much potential consequence that I'll just swallow my feeling and I am not seeing the reward and maybe also not trusting knowing how to have a nonviolent respectful communication 
or knowing this person, if you know them well enough, that you're expecting that, that they're not capable of joining you in a nonviolent, respectful, conversa honest conversation, or you're not giving them enough credit that um, they will be able to hear you if you communicate effectively. Sometimes like just not speaking up like why other kids in the past when I was younger, they wouldn't listen, they didn't care. Sometimes we're bringing our childhood wound or baggage into a relationship and not giving this new person credit that maybe they will hear me. And it's putting your being above the relationship. Remember the relationship is something separate. In my sort of idealistic view of you plus me plus we equals the possibilities. Oftentimes there's two people in a relationship and both might have an underlying feeling of, I don't really matter, I'm not significant. And one of them is overcompensating in a bullying way. And one of them is kind of their victim allowing themselves to um, be beaten down. So um, I don't want to lose my train of thought. <laughs> well, on, on that note, I, so I would say- Communication skills. Would you say, so would you say that, just to complete the, the thought, so would you say in case, so if, if the person, that, like if you do share your honest response or how you really feel or something that you really want to go for and you don't get the respect uh, from the other person or by either calling you names or, you know, verbally abusive or just being, you know, rude or, you know, hitting you on your vulnerable spots, knowing, like knowing how, how to hurt you in a way, even if it's like verbal, verbal or physically, but even if it's a verbal, you know, confrontation. So is that the walk away point? Like, is, is there a way to come back from this? Or is it just like, that's when you need to know your walk away point and just like take a step back and walk away from it? Those are interesting topics. Um, Cause I feel like everything is related to healthy boundaries. Like how do yeah. you set a healthy boundary? It's being able to say yes and no. It's, it's knowing when to say yes, that even if I'm nervous, it's worth the try because there's potential rewards that are greater than potential consequences and knowing when to say no, this is a no for me and no, thank you. And doing it as we're learning healthy boundaries, a lot of times the no comes out very wobbly with a lot of excuses. So it, it's a wobbly boundary and it, someone's more likely to push back on that. And you might have had this pattern with people and it's something to work on slowly. In my experience, for, you know, for me, I had a lot of what you're just talking about as far as having trouble saying no, living up to unrealistic expectations, walking on eggshells. And it has a lot to do with people pleasing. It's, it's like life and death to please, which it's very common. I mean, a lot of it's very taught to women, girls, very young, pardon me, but not only women a lot of people have this people pleasing like it all comes from outside it comes from a wound I think it had it's written down right here make me think of this it's a, a way of if you're not oh, uh, if you're not doing that you're not going to be loved or accepted in that way right this is setting up what you're talking about like not speaking up because you were afraid it would be it's part of codependence because my needs were not met as a child, my identity now depends on something or someone outside of me. That's what creates the people pleasing. That's what creates the, you know, I have to stifle whatever to please you. And that's what makes you feel terribly guilty, terribly sick, very apologetic if you displease someone. And for people like us that, you know, have had this pattern that's the challenge is to get okay with someone not liking your no. And when you get good at it and being really clear in a respectful way to yourself and others, that's what nonviolent communication is. And I'm going to give you a way of doing that in a minute. But if you 
it's communicating effectively. And if you do that enough and you get comfortable with it where it's not wobbly and wishy-washy and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, but no, no, thank you. It's different than, you know, I wish I could, but oh, all these excuses mm -hmm. that just provokes people. So when you get good at your no, you're going to start attracting the people that really can't tolerate your no's or tolerate your healthy boundaries are going to fall away. Ultimately, they're going to self-select. You don't have to push them away. They're going to push themselves away if that's the only way they know how to relate. And it's going to attract people that will respect and honor and appreciate your boundaries. An interesting thing about this that I've learned is when people have very mushy boundaries, codependency or hostile dependency, that's another thing we could talk about. Their healthy boundaries can look very cold to that person. And it's usually not one way, like we're making it sound like there's a bully and a victim. A lot of times that so-called victim or passive one also trespasses on boundaries in other ways. I have a great way of explaining that in a minute, but um, it's usually it's goes so interesting. So just wishy boundaries. We tend to not be aware of someone else's boundaries. Put our hand on someone else's plate and take a piece of food without asking them is an example. A very minor one and women do it all the time because they tend to not need as strict boundaries with each other. But in My general, grandfather used to do that all the time, but yeah. that's the, you know, that's yeah, a whole other a thing. Bit, like, like if he did that with someone that wasn't raised that way, they would find it extremely offensive. Yeah. Because that's I their boundary. That's, I think that's where like also culturally, it, you know, it's different yeah. because I grew up in Brazil and our, you know, personal and, are yeah. very different. They're more, I think they're mushier than, <laughs> than usual. Generally, than in Latin cultures, generally, there's a lot of, there's some mushiness within the family. And so long as everyone's okay with it, it's okay. But if it goes to an unhealthy level, I mean, everyone's different and individual. And that's part of why I said last time, there is going to be um, a power struggle of some kind, because everyone has their own unique boundaries and you're learning what they are and finding out, is this person going to respect them or not? Or finding out, this person's boundaries are so strict and so solid, I can't live up to that unrealistic expectation, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, real quick about the communication idea. Not sure where I learned this, so a book about boundaries and things like that. Um, if you could do it, it's called like a sandwich way of communicating something. First of all, you wanna say, is it a good time? Can you be present? I wanna talk about something. Not necessarily when you're heated up. It's when you're calm and you're cool, you've had a way of, you've been able to think about it and you're coming with love. Respect for yourself and others, honoring the divinity in yourself and others. Namaste, that's what that means. So the first part is saying, this is the trickiest part. When you do, or when you asked me, or when you told me, or when this happened, it made me feel a certain way. The honest feeling. The tendency at this point is you did this wrong, or it made me feel something that's not a feeling, that's a thought, a judgment. It made me feel that you're an asshole. It made me feel <laughs> that, that was not okay. It made me that's feel. Great. <laughs> It made me feel, those feel are like my that, feelings. That would that's be like the, the don't, right? Don't yeah. do like the, the don't. Well, you're saying something's a feeling that's actually a judgment. Mm -hmm. A feeling is, it made me feel guilty, ashamed, afraid, sad, angry. Those are feelings. How you feel, not, not put it on the other person. Like right, it's, you're just you saying, are answer, you're yeah. pointing out to them when you did this, and you could even be, I know you probably didn't mean this to happen to me, but this is how it felt. Like we said last time, an example, let's say a new couple is out at the mall and one of them got triggered by something and just their money issues came up. They started to feel bad and they just left and went home. And the other one's left there feeling abandoned and feeling really bad. Um, they could say when that happened, or you can, you know, one way to do a situation like that, it might be, once you calm down, feel the feelings, the wave of feelings, and it's not so intense. If I was in that situation, I'd say, can you tell me what happened? <laughs> Why? 
and then once they've had a chance to tell you, now you might see things very differently and you are already forgive them. It's like, oh, I have compassion for that. But you might also want to be really honest and say, when that happened, it made me feel abandoned. It made me feel scared. It made me feel insignificant to you. It made me feel like my feelings don't matter. Whatever, those are feelings. Um, so you're starting with that. This situation made me feel, and you can couch it with your, you know, you, I'm, you might've had the best intentions, but being me who I am, it made me feel this. Mm-hmm. Um, could you, wait, I think the first part is like asking them why or talking about it. Now it's the middle is the meat is how it made me feel. And the second, would you in future consider before you leave, we're out together, before you leave, let me know. Or before you da 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 da. Now, again, easier said than done. If you've had a chance to calm down, cool down, take responsibility for your own emotional energy, instead of Mm -hmm. spewing it out on someone, but you want it to go differently next time, you have the opportunity to say, this is what happened. Maybe be curious about why, your point of view, or you can ask that at the end. This is what happened. This is how it made me feel. And this is what I'm asking. You're not, you're not, you're not, you don't have the power to command them to do differently. You're just asking, this is what I would like. This is how I felt, this is what I like. And because people can relate to feelings because they probably have felt that way if they're in the range of you guys have a potential of having a good communication in the future, they will be able to to have compassion for that and sympathy for that. If you can do it in a way that's not a guilt trip to them, just, this is what happened. This is how it made me feel. Just letting you know. And this is what I, how I'd like us to deal with this. If it comes up again, this is what I'd like you to be aware of for the future. That's part of getting through the power struggle in a healthy and it's also being willing to be in that situation of hearing that from someone else and if they're going off the rails of accusing you can you be calm enough to say i hear that this upset you how did it feel tell me how it made you feel and you could even say oh i get it because i felt that way in other situations yeah and even just compassion for yourself and them and even just like me to do different what would you like me to do different so on both sides, you're going to be on both sides of this in a long relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so important uh, to bring awareness to to the relationship or how you're relating. And what I found that it makes it easier for me was taking a step back in any relationship, um, like not talking about it right away, but just take a step back if possible. I like to give it, you know, give it 24 hours or I'll come back to it in 24 to 48 hours. It's like customer service. <laughs> like we'll get back to it in 24 to 48 right. hours. That but I really feel like that's helpful to, to take that step back and meditate on it. You know, sometimes just like just like a, a good night of sleep too can change so much because maybe one of you is tired or maybe you didn't get enough sleep or you just had a long day. I feel like sometimes to say, can I hear you? Can we just come back to it tomorrow? You know, just go to sleep yeah. and like talk about it in the morning or something. Just be aware that maybe you're not in your best state or because maybe you're hungry or tired or you just had a long day, right. you know. Your cup is else. not full. And it's that's part of all of this too, is giving from your overflow and only you can fill yourself up. This is the instead of you complete me idea that I need to get all my needs met by you, I'm going to take care of my own needs the best I can so that I can come to you ready to give and receive love, fun, whatever. Um, And yeah, you might realize if you think about it and if you have the curiosity about what's the positive lesson, you might come around to be, well, I wrote a script and I'm not being fair. And you might also want to talk about that and be honest. You know, I was expecting this. And then I realized that I never even told you. So I wasn't being fair to you. But this is what I would like in the future. Yeah. Um, this brings me to a thing. And we're, we're at an hour already. Yeah. Um, 
what I want to talk about parent, child, and neutral adult, which is part of this approach and communicating and in, in general with anyone. Beautiful thing I learned also from Judy Nelson mm -hmm. in my school. She made it so clear. Imagine there's a neutral space between us or you and anyone. And you're on one side, someone else on the other side. And the goal is to be a neutral adult. That is someone with the healthy boundaries that's willing to say no, willing not to please everyone because they have to please themselves first and respecting other people's boundaries. But generally what we have is a parent and a child mode. There's the nice parent that's nice. You really should you really should do this. I really think you should do this. I really want you to do this. It's for your own good. When you hear the word should, that's a red flag. That's someone going into the parent mode as they know best and they're pushing past the neutral space into your space. How do you react to that? Most of us go into a child mode, a rebellious, no, get off my back. I'm not listening to you. Da, da, da. And it, it, the, the button, the child button is triggered. Now, sometimes the parent, it's really more obvious, it's very aggressive. Like someone gets angry or like types of behaviors you were talking about, abusive, angry. That's kind of the angry, mean parent mode, but there's also the gentle one, that kind one that has your best interest at heart, but they're going about it, pushing past your boundaries. So generally we find ourselves falling into a parent or a child place and it can go back and forth. You can be a child with one person and a parent with someone else. Like you know best with somebody else. And it's, that's obviously a controlling thing. And the child is saying, you can't control me, but they're not able to do it in the adult way. Now, if you see yourself in any of these roles in any given moment, you can pull back. The, the parent person in a parent mode has the option to pull back and say um, just a suggestion it's leaving it in the neutral space and they're actually more likely to pick it up instead of pushing it shoving something down someone's throat if you say oh you might want to try this or what do you think about this it just doesn't it sound softer and more inviting actually this worked for me I like this book I mean you you decide I don't care you read it now. I don't know if it's made. Yeah, you give, give them, the, I, you give them the resources. And now if you're in the child mode, it can be challenging, but it's also pushing it back to the middle. It's like over on you and it's pushing it back. Um, okay, I hear you because they want to be heard. This parent is wanting to be heard. They know best. I hear you. I'm going to think about it. I'll check it out. I'll, thank you. I appreciate you thinking of me is different than get off my back, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so this parent-child thing can come up in any relationship with a boss, a parent, a real child or a teenager. Um, yes, when someone's very young, the parent does have the say-so and probably does know best, but as soon as possible, seven, eight, you want to start giving a child more choice more responsibility, more taking responsibility for themselves because that's how they're going to grow up to be a healthy interdependent adult, neutral adult. Neutral adult is not that you don't have strong feelings and love and all of that. It's that I'm able to be an adult and respect you as an adult. You're an adult too. Mm -hmm. And I'm neutral about the outcome because I don't control you. It's ultimately about control. Yeah. When someone's pushing past boundaries. I wrote a script and you're going to follow it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have to create space for everybody to be able to be who they are and, and yes. allow that space to happen. And it's adjusting I know to the situation. People want to be heard, but it's also letting people have their consequences and letting people not like your boundary. So if you can be really clear, the consequence is I've asked you, let's say you've had that kind of conversation. I've asked you, I've told you, this makes me feel this way when you do this and da, da, da. I don't want to, I don't like being late for the theater, for mm -hmm. example, the movie theater. And you're always making me run at the last time. And I don't like missing the beginning. 
So next time I'm going, you know, if we're running too late, I'm just going to go and you can meet me there. Now, if you were to say that and not do it, that's a wishy-washy wobbly boundary and it teaches the other person they don't mean what they say. But if you actually do it, let them have their consequence. So what? And their consequence might be, I'm breaking up with you. If Depending it's like that extreme, it, it could be right. like, this has gone too far. I can't do this. I need you to hear me or da, da, da. It makes me feel this. I would like you to do this. And if not, this is what is going to happen and enforce it. Just like a parent needs to with a child. If you don't get your homework done, you're not whatever. You're not playing Nintendo or whatever. <laughs> yeah and but parents are our, very wobbly parents often are people pleasers to children i remember i remember our time for nintendo at least like in my with my uh cousins and you know the children in our neighborhood we had the time of how much time you can spend in the play nintendo and how much time you can spend outside uh so that was like those are two boundaries which was the curfew so you had, right. you know, you had so much time that you could have screen time and then you wanted to go outside, but then also you had to follow how much time you can stay outside because you have to come back at some point. Exactly. Uh, I mean, this is what, this is a, a part of why this problem occurs where someone becomes a little tyrant as an adult, which is like a mean parent maybe, is a parents, especially nowadays, they seem to have trouble. They become people pleasers to their children. So they have trouble enforcing a healthy discipline boundary. If this happens, this is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's life is so challenging, parents have to choose their battles. So they're better off not saying there's gonna be a consequence and not enforcing it. Because if you have a consequence and don't enforce it, it teaches the other person, the child, your boyfriend, whoever, that you don't really mean it and that they can now get whatever they want and push you and manipulate you. And it, it's like, it's disempowering to them too, because they're not gonna get away with it with everybody else. So if you're teaching a child, I don't really mean it and just, you can just do whatever you want and not, you're not learning a healthy discipline, healthy self-discipline. Mm -hmm. They become adults who are tyrants and the people around them have, they might attract a lot of people pleasers, but that's it. They're, you know, they're, it's like they're doomed to unhealthy type of relationships. So it's really important to create those healthy boundaries and, and enforce them and know where you stand and what is really important to you as far as what you, you're willing to say yes or no to. Just be aware of that within yourself, like getting to know yourself and what makes you feel comfortable and what are you comfortable with right. saying yes or no to. And Yes, and it is going to be awkward at first. Like I said, there's a growing pains with it where you're no, if you're a person who has trouble saying no your no might, like I said, come across very wishy-washy and stuff, but it's better than not saying it. It's practicing and real, and there's going to be some uncomfortableness and the guilt. And, and then when you realize, well, I have no reason to feel guilty. I have a right. It's when you decide I have a right to feel good and care for myself and discipline what my schedule is or whatever it is and not have like someone, let's say someone wants you to stay up till one, two in the morning with them every night and you have to work and you have to discipline, that could be a power struggle. Yeah. Can you explain to them, this is important to me. This is what I'm gonna do and do it. And if they don't like it, that's also part of what I, I think we touched on this last time where the idea of what's really most important, if it's really important to you to get your rest and be at work on time, is it more important to you than it is for them to have your company till two in the morning? Probably. But if it's that important to them, there's probably an issue. I mean, can you compromise? Can you do that on the weekend or? Yeah. If I they have like, I need you to stay up with me because my mom just died. Now that might be more important than you getting your rest that night for a few days, maybe, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah the be meeting. like they need that more than you need that. So that's what compromise is sometimes and be having honest conversations about mm -hmm. and this is so this is important to me that I'm willing to beg you or fight for it. Mm -hmm. 
And I know we're coming, we're already uh, went over a little bit. I know it's always so good to talk about this. I, I have to bring it to a closure, but I just feel time just flies by. I, know. Um, I just, before we go, I just wanted to uh, touch on uh, what we talked about a little bit, the dependency, codependency, inter interdependency, because I did, uh, I started uh, reading uh, or listening an audio book Uh, it's called Attached, and it's about the different attachment styles. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that they say that dependency is not necessarily a bad thing. That is good when you're in a relationship that you have someone to rely on. And, you know, yeah. and just like speaking of uh, self-confidence, self-worth, like when you know you can count on somebody, you know, you're going to do better in your life, have more success. It's going to be better for your well-being. And even, you, you know, your love hormones and all of that. So yeah. it's actually a good thing. There, there is a reason that we want to be in a partnership, in a relationship, because historically speaking, genetically speaking, you know, the strongest survives and, and it's always um, easier to survive and not only survive, but to thrive when you do have a partnership that supports you, that is reliable, that is always there for you. Uh, so I wanted to just end on a positive note as well that, you know, it is th th those advanced studies, but there are rewards as well of being in a relationship. There is a good thing of having someone that is there for you that, you know, late at night or any time of the day that you can count on, that you can share uh, with. And, and we're all here to relate. I mean, you know, that is another thing too, if we're talking about spiritually, uh or as part as part of our evolution um the relationship is the next step we're all here to relate and and to develop and evolve uh with within each other so just creating that healthy interdependency if we can just close yeah. with that um just like the positive aspects and rewards of yes that's the, that's the prize that's the potential <laughs> reward of going through all this trouble that we're talking about about learning new skills sticking up for ourselves, communicating, respecting what other people want and need within reason is healthy interdependency, the healthy mm -hmm. we. What yeah. a beautiful thing to have someone to rely on and they can rely on you. That's healthy commitment, which actually is the antidote of abandonment. Awesome. So love heals. Love heals. I love that. That is a great sentence to go out into the world, into the universe as we're approaching Valentine's Day. Uh, so I'm so happy that we had this amazing conversation Thank and you. I'm just going to put it out there to everybody who's listening. Love heals. All we need is love. We're all here for love. So let's keep yes. doing it. It's worth it. So love your inner child and that's going to spread out, make you more of a love angel in the world. Yes. Sounds good. Love, love is worth it. <laughs> love is worth the trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> If we learn something today is that love is worth the trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening. This is uh, Feed Your Soul Mixtape. I'm Julia. Thank you everybody for listening, for watching and for uh, sticking around and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day and happy, and happy Valentine's Day.